What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. Look, I'm so appreciative of the content that we create day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year for the past five plus years. Yo, it's been a journey. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's been rocking with us. If you didn't know, I'm going to tell you right now, we exist to center and amplify black and brown folks at work. And we do that by having really frank, authentic conversations. Think about like the conversations you have with a friend or a colleague or a mentor or aspiring mentor or mentee over drinks or coffee or whatever. It's when you're really having those real conversations about career and life and navigating the workplace. I was not privileged to have a ton of those conversations, but but the five that I did <laughs> really blessed me. Now I'm playing. I had more than five. I mean, come on. I've been working for a while, so I've had more than five. It feels like I've had like I feel like I can count the really authentic conversations on one hand. And I just remember years ago thinking about what does it look like to bottle that up and make it accessible to thousands of people because everyone doesn't isn't privileged to have someone that looks like you pull you aside over coffee or just on the side and give you the real talk. And that's what Living Corporate is all about. Yes, you're listening to the flagship show, but Living Corporate is a network of shows and everything that we do is based around authentically centering and amplifying historically marginalized voices at work by investigating, interrogating the systems and imagining a better, more equitable place to work. Yes, we fall into the diversity, equity, inclusion space, but we don't really use that language like that because a lot of that has been co-opted, watered down and centered around people that don't really need it. We're trying to have authentic conversations every single day that center and amplify the people that actually need to be centered and amplified which are black and brown people, black and brown women, black and brown queer folks, black and brown trans folks, black and brown non-binary folks, black and brown disabled folks, black and brown first generation people, right? Black and brown folks, period, right? That's what we're trying to do. And so thank you so much. I'm excited about the conversation you're about to listen to. We'll be right back. Jewel Love. Welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Zach, uh, winning on all levels. I'm glad to be here. Hey, I love that. First of all, let me say this. I don't know if I've met someone named Jewel before. Can you talk to me a little about like the background of your name? Yeah, and it connects to what I do, I think, as well. Uh, so I'm Jewel Love Jr. My father, obviously Jewel Love Sr. Uh, I'm biracial, so my father, African-American, mother, Scottish, Canadian. Dad got his name from his grandmother, so this is down in Mississippi, you know, early 1900. It's just like not a so common name for a black man from the South to have. Uh, but there you have it. And for me in my life, it's been something that I've been living up to and living into. It's not a common name, especially for a guy. So I've really been, uh, I'd say over these last few years, just starting to step more into um, I'd say that jewel piece of bringing value and, and a public presence and shining and also the love piece and how important love is. That's something that money can't buy, but it's, it's, it's absolutely priceless. It's one of the most valuable currencies uh, in, in humanity. So it's a name that I've had. It gets these responses and it's a public name in my mind. And it's something that I'm still uh, learning to live into. I mean, I love that. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. You talk about your people from Mississippi, you know, mm-hmm. my people from Mississippi also. So okay. Um, yeah, you know, so much, so much of your, what I see of your branding and your marketing is all about, it's focused on seven figure yeah. salary, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Hey, and a prioritization on black men. So, mm-hmm. you know, typically like when you, when I, when I meet folks who have a very specific prioritization on like a specific group of people. Yeah. Like there's some type of story or situation or experience that radicalized them mm-hmm. or really like turned or helped them pivot to really focus on that. I'd love to understand, did you have a moment of radicalization? And if so, what was, what was it to have you focused on helping black men specifically achieve seven figures out? Yeah. And like, and why? Yeah. So I've had multiple uh, like stages of radicalization uh, in my life, being a political radical in my 20s, my teens, things of this nature. 
But I think for me, it was just growing up with my dad and he's a businessman, small time businessman. So even as a kid, you know, five years old, four years old, six, seven years old, we would be in Oakland, California, down by Lake Merritt, and we would put together roses ahead of time and we go down there and I would use the cute factor, five year old kid, and I would sell roses and he would stand back in the cut and kind of guide me on, you know, how to do it, what to say, not to say, when to ask people. I hated it at the time. Absolutely. Come on, five years old, I got to go sell stuff in public. Uh, was not a fan, but people gave me money and that blew my mind that I could just go out to the street, have a product, talk to people and come home with money. So that really lit a fire into me for being an entrepreneur for a very young age. The vast majority of my uh, business experience, I guess you could say as a kid, was in the black community. My dad is very black community oriented. He always had a message around uplifting the black community. We're talking about black history and heroes and musicians and artists, this, that, and third politicians. So that was just a big part of my upbringing. And in my mind, I always knew I was going to, or I'd say most of the time, not always, but most of the time, I thought I was going to have some kind of a business uplifting in the black community. I just didn't know what it was. The thing about my dad is he had and has the entrepreneurial spirit, but he didn't have the training. He didn't really grow up around people that were guiding him on, let's say, how to move through corporate America. Absolutely not. Uh, so he was doing, and hence we were doing things like selling roses, selling sodas, opening up clean and sober nightclubs that would have, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 people come through. But one time he hit it huge. And it was a club called J Loves. So my nickname, his nickname, True Love. And it just became an absolute hit. It was in uh, Alameda, California. So we have folks coming from all over the Bay Area to this nightclub. And I saw like real business happen. I saw the, the bouncers and the people at the door and the DJs and cleaning staff and all that. And I saw money flowing. And I remember being in the car with him after one of his clubs, like the day after. And he just had this huge stack of cash. I mean, we're talking ones, fives, tens, and twenties, but it was just this huge stack. And he just said for me to count it. And I just felt this sense of empowerment that, wow, my dad is on top and he did it. So that was something that sticks out and was very memorable for me. I have a long and winding journey and, you know, we can touch on those points either now or in another time. But during my late twenties, when I was starting my psychotherapy business, cause that started before coaching, I knew I wanted to focus on black men. And I personally was still trying to find out like, what was my tribe? What was my community as an adult? Where do I kind of belong? This, that, and the third. So I was doing psychotherapy. I was pretty sure I wanted to work with black men, but I wasn't sure which niche. There's a lot of diversity in the community. So you got black, let's say boys, so eight years old, nine years old, you got teens, uh, a lot of energy in, 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 in high school. You got brothers just out of prison who got war stories that you would not believe. Just make the hair on the back of your neck just stand. It's just gripping. Uh, but none of these was really my niche until a brother who came in super sharp, dressed, suited, booted, Harvard Business School grad, about to get married from a two-parent, healthy, uh, black family, went to private schools, and was one of the coolest dudes that I've ever met, and grounded, and very down-to-earth, and all about giving back to the community. And I was just blown away, because I didn't grow up around men like this, so I was just like, who is this guy, what, what community is he part of? So I doubled down. I called my business black executive men. People said black men won't pay for therapy. They don't want to go to therapy. You can't make a living. I just knew different. I doubled down. Black executive men was born eight years ago in Oakland, California, and more brothers started to find me. Then I started getting workshops at Google and Microsoft and NVIDIA and PayPal and Capital One and Upwork, and Pepsi and all these other organizations doing black mental health workshops and some focused just on black men. Two years ago, I pivoted to coaching after I had a, a, you'd say a radicalization moment of having my own. Nope. Three years ago is when I had a coach 
I was living in the United States. The pandemic hit. I said, forget it. I'm going to Latin America. So I hired a coach. He helped me get over my fears and took my whole business virtual. And then I started traveling, which I've been doing for the past three years. And I currently live in Mexico. But here's the kind of behind the scenes secret that I rarely share with people. Uh, There's a bit of a selfish nature for why I do what I do. And it's to have mentorship, guidance, education from black men that are just killing it, not only in the business world, but are family men, morally on point, got the right values, are committed to giving back, uplifting. These are my idols. So for me to both work with them as their coach and previously therapist, I was also learning and healing at the same time from really taking it from what my dad gave me. And then we all get to a point where it's time for us to take the baton and take the next step. So that's really the community that I've built here at Black Executive Men. I love it. I learn. I'm inspired. But at the same time, I take the best wisdom. I've never worked in corporate America as a W-2 employee. And that surprises people, but I haven't. But I work with you know, guys that are directors and senior directors, VPs, SVPs, C-suite guys, individual contributors, and I get the best practices. And I also get the worst practices. The best things guys are doing, I see what the worst that guys are doing. And then I put that back out into the community of do this, avoid this. I've seen it work. And to come full circle, uh, I hope to answer your question around seven figures. So growing up, Tupac, Biggie, Outkast, Too Short, uh, Jordan, you know, later on, you know, LeBron. These were the brothers I saw making seven, maybe eight figures. I didn't know anything about the black business class. So when I started to find that there are guys who are very quiet on social media that are making seven figures, either in salary or just total or total compensation, which that's usually the case or through their investments, it blew my mind and said, we as a community need to know who these men are, how they did it, and how the rest of us can do it too. So I started advertising myself as a seven-figure coach for Black men, and the branding, the positioning has blown up. Man, love it. They're like, I've never heard of this. I've never seen it. I want to be a part of it. So that's where we are today, and I'm figuring out that blueprint and helping guys figure it out themselves on how to reach seven figures. That's incredible. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if I've spoken with someone before who ex- who exists in this intersection of because I recognize that you got your master's in clinical psychology, yeah. Um, and so, like, but someone who really sits at the intersection of like personal economic empowerment as and like this mental health ba- place and space. Why do you think that that's that might be rare? Like the idea of, hey, I'm going to focus on wellness and mental health and like, you know, coaching and all these things. And then also, hey, I'm also going to get you paid or make sure that you are finan- you have financial, quote unquote, security. Security is a broad relative term. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't am I do you think I'm overstating it that that intersection is rare? Like, I don't meet a lot of I haven't met a lot of people who do that. No, I don't. I don't think you're overstating. I think it is probably pretty rare, especially in the black community. I, I'd say probably, yeah, more rare than, than other things for sure. I mean, there's been an evolution in how I view wellness and engage in it these days uh, as opposed to being a mental health provider. So I don't provide any mental health services for guys anymore. Mental health is still one of my superpowers, but as far as a psychotherapist, Uh, I've let that go, given up my license, and I just do coaching these days. So while I used to help brothers that were struggling with trauma, anxiety, uh, PTSD, imposter syndrome, other mental health disorders, that's not particularly what I do now. But one of the things that I discovered uh, in working with over 500 guys in eight years is that a lot of that stuff, especially with imposter syndrome, is coming because there are institutionally and structurally things missing for black men to win in the business world. And it creates all of this angst and it uh, exacerbates any kind of underlying disorder that might be there. So I started thinking, Hmm. well, what if we just had a network where black men could just win 
and just get jobs and knew how to get promotions and raises like the very best of us are doing and had access to Fortune 500 C-suite black men for direct mentorship on a weekly basis and had a network with other black men that are uh, striving, achieving, family focused. How would that impact the mental health of our community? And Hmm. what I've seen is it's, I'm looking at my phone right now because the messages I get from the different networking groups that I run under black executive men are, I get them every week. This group is phenomenal. I didn't even know I needed this to network with other black men. This was the missing piece in my development. I feel better. I'm doing better. I just got a new job. I'm applying to 10 more. I've got a new mentor. I'm going for funding. I've got the confidence locked in. So although the emphasis of the work that I currently do, it's not overtly on mental health or wellness, structurally by providing, in my own small way, some of the pieces that corporate America does not, by and large, guys are feeling better. They're showing up more confident. Yeah, let's let's keep let's keep it going. Like um, it's interesting. So I'm 34. um, And so. Um, you know, it's, I, I find like I find my demographic like very curious, like black men as a whole, certainly uh, black millennials and then also black Gen Xers and early baby boomers. Like I just find this like uh, straight black men or straight presenting black men, I'll say even um, it's very curious um, because you to your point, you've engaged over 500 black men like you've you've been coaching and working with them ex- specifically for years. Um, I'm curious, like from like a, like thematically, like what are you seeing in terms of patterns? You, you mentioned it just now about ways that, uh, corporate America fails and or has gaps in supporting black men at work. I'm curious, like what are the themes that you're, you, you would see are, uh, that are, that repeat as it, as it pertains to the ways that black men are not supported. Yeah. Um, So there's just, I think, something to be said about presenting information in a cultural way. I live in Mexico. So if somebody were bringing a product to Mexico, I don't know, like a cleaning product or something like that, Mm -hmm. and they're having a commercial on TV or billboards, if they're not talking in Spanish, it's not going to land very well. If they're not using the Spanish that's spoken here in Mexico or this part of Mexico, they're probably potentially going to miss their mark. Now, there is some kind of crossover culturally, this and that, but uh, it's important to know your market and your demographic. I think corporate America doesn't do the best job in speaking to black men directly about the challenges that they're experiencing, and it's gendered as well. There are growing number of communities, funding opportunities, promotion opportunities, networking groups uh, by black women in by other people for black women. So the message has been getting out more and more, always more work to do that focusing on that niche demographic of black women in corporate America, it's something that's valuable and maybe should be done. It's not really the same for black men. There isn't as many tailored cultural and gendered programs, funding opportunities, mentorship opportunities, specifically for black men. So I would say those are some of the things that uh, could improve funding opportunities, executive sponsorship opportunities, networking opportunities. Uh, Yeah, the mentorship, absolutely huge, but targeted specifically for black men. It's not particularly novel, the things that are needed, but presenting it in a gendered and racial way I think it's missing. And I'll give you an example in the psychotherapy industry. When people were saying, you know, black men don't want therapy or they can't afford therapy or they won't come to therapy. I pretty much knew that it was a marketing issue of psychotherapy. When you look at psychology today, it's mainly white women that they have on the front of their magazine. And if you uh, you get a subscription to them, their online service, you get a magazine. And that's who was on the cover for the longest So advertising, if you put a white woman on the front and just, you know, shout out, white women are doing some phenomenal things in the world of therapy. And yet, if that's who's on the front of the cover and it's talking about tears, tissue and trauma, that's not really how that's not going to reach. That's not going to land. 
with black men for the most part. So what is it? What is the languaging? What is the color scheme? What is the goal that would land for black men to come in droves into psychotherapy? And so I just started you know, studying the market and found out something aspirational. They wanted to be an executive. There's very little out there that's promoting black men to be fortune 500. It's very rare for you to see something like that. You have the executive leadership council, you have black men in tech, you have Afro tech. But when we talk about a gendered specific space for that goal, it's very rare. So I knew that hitting on those buttons of aspiration, of power, of boldness, of pride, of manhood, masculinity, it was going to resonate with my audience for them to feel safe enough to come in, pay, book services, and then pretty much do the same thing everyone else is doing in therapy, tears, tissue, and trauma. But it had to be packaged in a way that spoke to my demographic. And I think it's the same lack of that packaging in corporate America today, which for my own company and others listening out there creates a huge opportunity as well. So, you know, it's interesting, like kind of getting back to like the seven figure part. Right. Um, And and the coaching that you provide, like this is a two prong question. First of all. Like to your point, like the data shows that black men, black folks and black folks, period, are wildly underrepresented in C-suite positions. Certainly uh, uh, C, uh, chief executive officer positions um, like literally like you can count them on one hand with three fingers. Right. Um, further, like as we look at this economy. Like we're seeing black and brown people, particularly black folks, particularly black women, but also black men being disparately impacted by like all these layoff decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm curious, what is your messaging or like perspective on the current landscape economically related back to the coaching you provide? Right. Like, because it feels very um, dire right now for black folks, particularly black men so in, in light of this conversation, like what does it look like to provide coaching in this particular season and context? Yeah. So there's a lot of fear and angst out there and guys are losing their, uh, and gals losing their jobs left and right, especially when, yeah, uh, definitely like the diversity whole field that's taken a huge hit. Uh, black in tech in general, that's taken a huge hit. There's other industries as well, but those were, you know, areas that were very much like thriving for the black community to go and get these very high paying jobs um, uh, relative to a lot of other jobs. And then, you know, things started tightening up and folks were losing jobs, getting out of corporate altogether, doing completely different stuff, trying to get into other fields, sectors, industries. I recommend non-sexy jobs, folks. (laughs) Look at the industrials, you know, look at the stuff that isn't so hot and popping, entertainment, tech, stuff like that, because there's huge opportunities over there. We just don't always think about them. Uh, But there's still a lot of opportunity. Here's what I noticed as a coach, because I can't change racism. That's more of them on the DEI side of the equation. That's not actually my side of the equation. My equation is optimizing my guys to make the most of the opportunities that are on the market today. And I'll give you some examples. So I do an initial confidence assessment of new clients that come in and then we do one uh, when they leave so with things like uh, confidence in their resume or linkedin profile or connections or posting on linkedin or them being on a podcast tour like i'm on right now them having their own podcast like you have right now having their own newsletter knowing their professional mission knowing their impact statement knowing their why knowing how they're the best in the world at what they do literally not figuratively, growing their network so they have people giving them opportunities on a weekly basis, high quality for for funding, for new jobs, for investment opportunities. Most of the guys coming in are not scoring very high in these categories. And here's what, but here's what they are typically scoring well at, doing their job. They do their job well, and that's the message they've been told on how to win in corporate America. It's to do your job well. 
but then they notice so-and-so getting pa- passing them up for the promotion. And then so-and-so is now a VP, but they're doing their job well, but they didn't get the education and they didn't have the awareness because perhaps their first generation in corporate America that doing your job is one piece. It's a very important piece, but it's only one out of so many pieces that need to be optimized for you to optimize your entire career. And so those are the things that guys are walking out with eights, nines, seven, eights, nines, and tens in all of these categories and saying, I have so much opportunity that I wasn't even aware of. So as a community, and this is not about finger pointing, we can do that. Uh, There's a time and a space for that. But just to call it what it is based on what I see and then tools for how we can win, we're under optimized as a community. However that happened, no matter where it came from, that's what I see on a daily basis. Frankly, I wouldn't limit that to just our community. A lot of communities don't get this education, but with it, guys' careers become absolutely explosive. So even in this market, there's a ton of opportunity typically for someone to optimize themselves as as an employee uh, in the marketplace to unlock tremendous opportunities that they may not see and they may not be aware of if they've simply been wearing the hat of, I do my job well and everything else is taken care of. You know, to your point, Jewel, like I meet people who are terrible at their job and there you go. accelerate all the time. So, Thank you. <laughs> Hammers the point <laughs> home. Like, and I think, I think the other piece, this is where I, I realized earlier in my career is the idea of doing a good job is actually much more nebulous hmm. than folks would like, that are comfortable admitting, right? Like very rarely are organizations or leaders sophisticated, uh, mature, whatever term you want to use enough to really say, Hey, you're doing a good job. Like, yeah, people will say that, but like, it's a sliding scale that's applicable to the people that they like or the people that check certain other boxes. It's not like it's, it's rare for me. Like, I think we, to your point, like we are coached uh, and conditioned to believe that being good at your job, first of all, is quote unquote enough, Mm -hmm. but also that good at your job is something that is fixed and objective. Mm. And it's rarely that, Um, you know, like I, I think about, hell, I was in a, position jewel i had a tech company where at there was a certain level there was a certain go-to-market responsibility of my job so in my mind i said well then part of me being good at my job is selling and generating pipeline building real authentic pipeline not oh you have x amount of cold opens cold emails that you sent out and you're counting that as pipeline that's not pipeline you that's a whole separate podcast we got mm-hmm. have another day mm-hmm. but the point is is like you know i'm over looking i'm like oh shoot i got I got half a million dollars in pipeline. That's X amount. That's um, in the last two months. That's X percent higher than the average that people have done in the same period of time. So I'm th- I, in my mind, I've built up this entire rubric for what good is. And that wasn't really how they were defining good. Cause they had no real definition of it there. Right. And like that uh, lack of clarity or organizational competence is not really that rare. Like, and so to your point, like I'm say all that to agree with you that like it's all it's really about understanding your why, understanding your purpose, your position, your value proposition, and then like moving against that, right? Um so 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 let me ask you this then. Like, you know, when I think about coaching black men, um, and I say this as a black man talking to another black man, the two words that come to mind to me are vulnerability and intimacy. Um, and I think like for a bunch of reasons that we do not have the capacity for, for this particular conversation, um, those are the things that I don't know if black men by and large are like encouraged to pursue an intimacy. Isn't just about romantic intimacy, just like just personal, just like having a level of closeness and making yourself emotionally available or vulnerable to like really learn and grow and be challenged and like in the in the real ways not like the superficial stuff that's a point of view i have that's an assumption i'm making about like us as a whole i'm curious like do you find there to be 
work that has to be done to build trust and vulnerability so that coaching can really happen and and the transfer and and the, and the support that you can provide can really be delivered yeah a couple of things come to mind so a uh, huge piece so i'll go back to the therapy days um Therapy's like probably way more vulnerable than coaching because people are showing up saying something's wrong. Something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with my mind. Something's wrong with my relationship. Yeah. Something's wrong with my bank account. Something's wrong. And if they're not used to doing that because they're concerned for any number of reasons and they're concerned about being judged negatively or taken advantage of in, in some way, maybe that information is used against them, hurt them or something like that. Um, yeah, that, that can make psychotherapy, scary, terrifying, really. Uh, the other piece is when you're dealing with mental health, um, that, you, you know, there's people, you know, out on the street with, you know, dual diagnosis. They got, let's say, drug or alcohol addiction and then some other kind of mental health disorder. And we can throw these things in the mental health bucket. So when they're coming in, they're thinking, wow, is this person going to drive me to being out there on the street because they're going to mess with my mind? So they're really thinking kind of life and death when it comes to the realm of psychotherapy. Of, am I going to lose my family if this person guides me incorrectly? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my mind? Am I going to end up in a psych ward, you know, uh, in one of those white jackets, you can't move situation? where they're doling out medications and I can't say no. People go, absolutely go there. And there are cases where that happens um, in the mental health world. It, world. it has not always been so positive and it isn't always so positive or good for the black community uh, in terms of mental health. So there are some real, you know, genuine fears there. I'd say coaching is different. Coaching is very success in success focused and, kind of lifestyle design driven. So many of the people that are coming to me, they're not first coming to me because of a mental health disorder. So it's very dip different in many ways than treating brothers for mental health services. So the vulnerability isn't quite the same. Uh, the other thing is the framing. Yeah, the framing isn't healing, which healing and vulnerability, those are like together in my mind. Hmm. It's about accountability and success. And brothers are already locked in. I don't have to fight too many people in corporate on that point. Outside of corporate, I do actually, interestingly enough, get pushed back on all kinds of reasons, all kind of seven figures is too much. You don't need that. Why are you pushing that on the community? Uh, this is impossible. Things I used to think. This is impossible. This is a scam. This is a fraud. All That's what I used to think, too, until I met the guys. And I was like, this is incredible. This is, this is possible. These are our heroes. We need to know about these guys. So vulnerability, a little bit less. But I think there's a couple, two things come to mind. Number one is in a vacuum, just having someone be vulnerable in the black community with just all the trauma and history and racism and brutalization, this, that, and the third. And uh, the challenge is coming from inside of the black community, from outside of the black community. It can be hard to know who to really trust, really trust with matters of the heart. And so I think that structure as a community is not necessarily there. Of How do we interact with one another on these deeper levels? I don't think we have that protocol locked in, uh, maybe for other yeah. things, but not for that. that. That, I don't think that's there. So that's the first thing that comes to mind of, that kind of goes outside of what the cultural norms are in the black community to do that. Not that we can't, I think we just need structure for it. And then it will be a part of our culture as opposed to maybe viewing it as something outside of our culture or, um, or, or risky in some way. The other thing is, you know, I'm here, like I said it here in Mexico and the people are very typically very warm, very open, and very supportive. When I walk into the gym, there's guys I don't know that are very much like, hey, how's it going? Oh, are you using this weight machine? In American gyms, and this is just all races, 
going to the gym and it's I don't know what side of politics they're on. I don't know what's who's what. I don't know where they stand. I don't know mental health. This is not my friends. You're not you're not my friends. I'm not your friend. We'll be friendly, but we'll mainly avoid each other. That's pretty much my experience in American gyms because it's it's just always being ready for. And I'm not like a violent dude, but some popping off or some situation or somebody being angry at somebody for some reason. Right, right, right. And there's all these dynamics of why that could be the case. Not like that here in Mexico. There's a unity amongst the people uh, that just makes it flow smoother. So I think that goes back to maybe within our community. And that's some of the things that I'm working on here in Black Executive Men. What are the expectations? What are the expectations? What's what's okay? What's not okay here? And looking for the best qualities that support our success mentally, emotionally, financially, and being pretty heavy handed for a helping purpose. And I think that many in my community, specifically black executive men community, they appreciate somebody who's setting the boundaries and it helps them to feel safe. Uh, I know where I stand, whether I agree or disagree, by the way. I do right. know where I stand, what's expected, what's appropriate in this space. And then it lets guys just kind of relax. That's really good context. And I appreciate that. I think and the reason I was talking, I use that word vulnerability and intimacy is because I've had situations where, you know, you think about, so people use the term imposter syndrome, which I, I, I'm i really um, divesting from, but this idea of just, you know, not feeling like you're good enough or, um, you know, feeling like you need to, uh, that you're not adequate enough in whatever regard. And so like this idea of like, Hey, look, I really don't actually know what I'm doing here. I need some help. Yeah. Like, just that level of like, that <laughs> level of vulnerability. Right? Yeah, man. And, like, and so like I meet, and so I've met folks who are a little bit older than me, um, who, you know, they would share that with me. Like, like this is in the context of work. I'm, I'm not a coach. I don't profess myself to be a coach. This is the context of like we were working together. So they might share, hey, I actually, I'm really not as good as this as, as people think I am, or I don't really know what I'm doing, or what the case is. And it took a lot to share that, right? And then we worked together and we, we were able to be successful to a degree. But when I think about just like, hey, it, it can cost, it's a lot just to even share, hey, I'm not as knowledgeable on this as you, or hey, I don't really, I need to learn this, I don't understand. Like that's not always, like we're not rewarded for declaring our ignorance in a particular space. And so for me, it's like, that's great that you're able to create that level of trust by boundary setting and effective communication. Um, I, I just find it very curious because um, I've seen the opposite. Like I've seen, I've seen struggles with that. Yeah. You know, probably the guys that make it to me have gotten past that on some level because we're going to have to ask for help for me. I mean, you know, I'm making posts on LinkedIn or wherever else, and I am reaching out to people in the DMs, but they don't have to respond, and many don't. So I think the guys that are ready to engage with me, uh, they know what's going on. They know what time it is. And if they're ready, they will. And, you know, probably the majority don't. Uh, it's just, you know, either I'm not the right coach for them, they're not open to being vulnerable in that way uh a whole a whole host of reasons yeah yeah 100 percent. like jewel look this has been a fire conversation I we're wrapping no we're just getting going here <laughs> okay next time no here no 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 so here so here's the thing first off i'm gonna ask this one last question then we're gonna wrap it up okay. after soon after that you know you talked about and i've i've been following you know we follow each other on social for a while mm -hmm. um what led you to exit the United States and find somewhere else. And like, 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 what was that? What was the, what, why one? And then two, how do you think it informed your coaching practice as a, a black executive coach coaching other black executives? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Anything is possible. That's uh, what it led me to believe. Now, do I still have my limitations? Yes. Do I still have my mindset blocks? Yes. But I think it, it kind of had me plant my flag more on that side of the equation that anything is possible by being able to live outside of the United States. Cause I just, 
not even possible. I never even, I didn't even consider it until the pandemic hit. And then my mind opened up and then now I'm living here. I, you know, I would not want to go back unless there's family emergency, something like that, where I have to live back in the States because I really enjoy it outside. And that may change in the future, but for now I'm really enjoying what the world uh, has to offer. So the thing that made me shift, uh, there was uh, a couple of things. I'll share one personal and then one uh, uh, probably more professional because uh, I know this is more of a professional podcast. So I want to keep it mainly in that domain. Um, and I'll start there. So the professional piece of the puzzle is uh, going virtual was, you know, had me thinking, well, I'm doing this from home. I don't have to rent the office space. I could do this from anywhere in the world and I can learn and I can grow and things of that nature. And I could probably even save money because at the time, so I grew up very poor in, in Oakland. I mean, uh, hand me down poor. Uh, our whole family had one shelf on the refrigerator sharing with two or three other families in the same home poor, soup kitchen poor. Uh, we we're still happy. We didn't know any different, but that's where I came from and have been poor. People use working class, poor people say poor. I mean, we're just poor for most of our lives and pretty, pretty normal for me. But then I started making a little money as a psychotherapist. And I was like, oh, there's a future here. Yeah, this is, this is good. After many failed businesses, it started to click. And then I started to see exchange rates from other countries. And it's like, I could instantly double my money if I just lived in another country. Like, I don't have to change my prices. I don't have to change my business, my clientele. I could instantly, everything I have could double if I just hopped on a just flight. Went. Is that actually right? Is that how exchange actually works? Is that what's going on? So there is this financial piece of the puzzle uh, for me, which is, Actually, how it is, guys, I know if, if, if you're wondering about that and you were kind of landlocked like I had been a bit, that's pretty much how it goes. It just goes further. So it's amazing. On the personal side of the equation, um, the United States with the, the intensity of uh, political polarization just started to take a toll on me. And I would see it and hear about it every day. It would show up when I was working in an office at the time, at the office, in the politics, how people were interacting. And it just seemed like people were moving further and further away from each other. And it was just becoming this antagonistic society, but also just day-to-day experience. And I got sick of it. I just said, you know what? This is not, I don't have a future in this. And it's, uh, It's not my job to fix this. I could, the amount of effort it would take to make a dent in what's going on right now would be just a life's work. I'm not called to doing that. I'm a U.S. citizen. I got a passport. I'm about to take advantage of this. Where can I go? And so I started traveling. First place landed in Colombia and then went to Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, and then uh, now I order in Mexico <laughs> and I found countries where I just felt comfortable. I felt comfortable on a racial level, on a color level, on, uh, on a police, the situation level. I never really had issues with police, but it's just always in my mind. I got to worry about them, but I'm paying their bills and, you know, and shout out to all the policemen and army and military people doing a phenomenal job, this, that, and third, but, and this is my experience. Um, and I was tired of having that experience. So I don't have that in Latin America. Other Latinos do because of their relationship uh, with his, historically what's going on here. I'm an outsider in that way. So for me, there's a level of calm and peace. So very personally, it was to be a part of an environment, culture, and atmosphere where I felt affirmed. I feel included. I feel uplifted. I feel at peace. And I do on a day-to-day basis. I feel at peace uh, here in Mexico. That's incredible. Uh, Jewel, now look, before I let you go, here's my last question. I'm going to get you out of here, I promise. What would you say, um, especially as we're looking at, um, looking at like the current landscape and organizations seeking to attract and retain black men, 
and their respective organizations, what would you say the top three things they need to address and fix right now? Yeah. So, and this is and because I worked, I've done workshops with corporations. I, whoever's listening that's in that HR role or that C-suite role or that diversity role, I get this would be very hard for you to do. Number one is making sure they have access to black male coaches. Now, not every black man wants to work with a black male coach. About 50% do, 50% don't. They want to work with other races, gender, et cetera. But making sure they have access because if your org has a coaching program, like one of the big names or whoever you're contracting with, they may not have very many or any or just very many black male coaches. So when we're talking about retention productivity, that's a good bet to invest uh, in a platform or somehow to make sure they have access to black male coaches. Uh, Otherwise, they either may not get the coaching at all uh, or they're paying out of pocket where other uh, uh, ethnicities may not have to do that. And that's just not fair uh, because there's plenty of, let's say, white male and female coaches. So that's one key thing to provide. I think the other thing that comes to mind is around the different conferences. They just had Afrotech. I talked about black men in tech. Uh, They just have a lot of black industry conferences out there. Tons, actually. Making sure they have access to those and that if they ask to go to them, you should probably encourage them to go. Because they're going to get a certain nurturing that quite possibly your organization is not going to be able to provide. But they're going to look at it as my organization cares for me because they're encouraging me to get this experience that not just want, but in some cases really do need on a psychological level. So I'd say that'd be the second thing. I guess they both fit under the bucket of uh, professional development. The third one, I got to sit with that one. I think those first two are, are, are good ones though. Good to go. I agree. Jewel, look, man, it's been a pleasure. Make sure you want to learn more about Jewel love and the work that he's doing check out the link in the show notes black executive men make sure y'all it's a it's an investment in yourself and look coaching is just a beautiful thing um it's critical uh for a bunch of different reasons uh but ultimately you have to invest in yourself jew we can see you're a friend of the show we look forward to having you back man zach i appreciate what you're doing thank you so much all right man peace And we're back. Yo, thank you so much for listening to Living Corporate. You know where we at. We're everywhere you listen to podcasts. You know what I'm saying? We're literally everywhere you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about Living Corporate, living-corporate, please say the dash.com or just Google Living Corporate. You know what I'm saying? At this point, SEO is pretty popping. You type in Living Corporate, we're going to pop up somewhere. Okay. Make sure you check us out. Links in the show notes. So you learn more about us, learn what we're trying to do. Make sure you actually create a profile on living-corporate.com. Okay. Make a profile on there so you can actually stay in tune and up to date with what we got going on. You make a profile, you select content that you're really interested in, and then we'll push content to you from our library. So you can actually have a curated experience every time you go and log into living corporate. Ain't that dope? Okay. Think about that. We got over a thousand podcasts and and different digital media and content that we've made over the years. And it's going to be all pushed and curated for you, baby, for you, dog, for you. All right. Till next time. I love you. Take care of yourself. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.